The Arrogant History of White Ben, Chapter 12, Queen Elizabeth on Crows. Left alone, Ben relaxed upon his pillow and stared at the picture of Queen Elizabeth, and as his sensitive fingers of sight touched hers, he experienced a shock. It was like pushing into its socket the queer pronged button which Petal last night had called a plug. Light came. He was fixed eye to eye, soul to soul. Her thoughts poured into him. He could question and she would answer. While the small tunes of summer sparkled in through the open window, a bee zoomed in like a bullet and out again. A broken-voiced cuckoo choked in a distant tree. There was a clink of glasses from the cedar. Then a radio began to grind out a war tune, a secession number now. Goodbye, the soldier said. Don't cry, the soldier said. Behind all these sounds, sinister as the intermittent rumble of guns, came the emancipated cawing of the crows. <coughs> Excuse me. Their nests are empty, said the queen's eyes. Their duties are done. They have nothing more to do with their lives but to feed and work mischief. And Ben, gazing emboldened into those talking eyes, so bright and so familiar, answered, You are like my maker. She had red hair and just such black, pleasant eyes and just such a little thin red mouth. Her name is Ellie, and I am the work of her hands. Have you ever made anyone like me? The eyes burned. Their touch ran down into his brain in the form of living thoughts. They sank into his breast and set the mandrake throbbing. He realized that he had flagged in the morning, had wilted and become placid. Virtue had gone out of him. He had, depu he had deputed his powers. Now power was throbbing through him again. The mandrake, stung for life, was giving out energy. He had the strength to ask questions and take from the succumbed similitude the succumbled, ha, and take from the succumbled similitude of power, power's answer. She made me. You are like her. Have you ever made anyone like me? He waited, content to let the reply come in its own good time and way. His eyes, fixed on the portrait, had ceased to see the rest of the room. He lay in the red cave of the bed and its curtains closed in on him, and the only outlook was through those eyes, black and pleasant. The only light which penetrated to him was the light of those eyes. Their thoughts were with him and about him. They wrapped him like red hangings. The bed on which he lay was charged with them. The red ceiling had received them. The red tented walls had them through the century, had held them through the centuries. He had soaked in the thoughts of the creature who had once lain beneath the red coverlet, even as he had been soaked by the mist of the churchyard. He could ask what he liked, he would be answered. He could learn what he chose, for the wisdom of a spinster was, it, was his to command. A scarecrow must always turn to the single woman, to the spinning woman, to the barren stocks. The word hummed in his head. Barren stocks, the stem of a rose tree which never flowered. That was a barren stock. The pea sticks, the hop poles, the palings. These were barren stocks, and he, with a broomstick for arms, and a handle, and a hoe for a leg, he himself was no more. The humming in his head was a voice which spoke, and he had his answer. The Queen of Scotland is lighter of a fair son, but I am a barren stock. Then, with long red pauses, came more thoughts. Behind them was intermingled the folly of the crows and the momentary song of England. When I am far away, remember what I say, the soldier said. But the humming thoughts overruled these intimations of reality. A painted queen was speaking her thoughts to her fantastic air. And you, my little scarecrow, are a barren stock. Your carcass is crooked. Your arms are weak and powerless. You limp mine own poor stock, but a brain you have and a heart. Let not your heart govern your head, but let your head use your heart, for in that heart of yours lies the power, for you have to do with loving sleep. Everyone preyed on them without mercy, but they followed because I fondled them, and so 
bastard or Norman blood, who cared? But at that, Ben cried out, The Normans were crows. Their blood is in most of us. One should cut a vein thin and drain out such blood. And he went off into a gobble of horror learned by heart. Oppression, oppression, muttered Ben and quavered into old George's song. So four beans to make your row, one to rot and one to grow, one for the rook and one for the crow. Then his voice frightened him because it was so loud and lonely in the room where the only outer sound was the crow's distant cawing. He dropped back into thought. The crows carry off the yellow chicks and the leverets, he whimpered. They stunt the trees with their great foul nests. They kill the primroses with their refuse. Forty-five pheasant eggs in a day. Old George can tell you. Old George saw all the sheds lying under one nest. They rob, I tell you. They ravish. They watch till the eagles are clear of the eyrie. Then they come cawing and murder the young princess. No one knows, snuffled Ben. No one cares except White Ben, but they are too many for him. He needs help. You should help him. You should tell him what to do. At once the answer came softly. When I was no older than the child who made you, when my hair was of her color and I could run as quickly to my goal, then I began to think my own thoughts and hide them. I was not meek, but I feigned meekness. I watched those whom I obeyed, and so I learned my lessons. Ben raised himself on his stiff elbow. It was a wonder to, to him how clearly, as he listened to the humming voice, he could remember his hilltop. He could smell the fields and the bramble hedges. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the morning glories opening in worship. Also, he heard the wind. The wind, the child's voice, and the queen's voice were woven into one sound. It was a wonder to him hearing it within himself so clearly that he still heard also outside himself the cawing of the rooks. It was as if he had two pairs of ears. Excitement ran through him to find himself so variously alive. He rolled in delight on the bed, getting the sense of the silk and the pheasant ridges of the embroidery, and at the same moment felt the hilltop wind taking his arms and tossing him to his job. The wind won. It was stronger than reality, for the child's voice was in it. It was also the queen's thought. Its vibrations overwhelmed all other quiverings, sensations, and sounds. When I was thirteen, the voice throbbed in him. The crows came to pluck out my eyes, but I was prepared. I had listened to the whispers of chamber, parlor, street. I had watched the little thoughts which flicker in a man's face unknown to him. I drew my knowledge of my masters into myself. Then, when the time came, with their tongues I spoke, with their power I thrust out my arms, and I frightened away the settling crows. My sister's crows had settled upon the land, and rent it, but they could not rend me. They devoured her people, but they could not devour me. I could not be broken, I could not be beaten, I could not be burned. Oh, even that I bore the mandrake heart in my breast, the heart that casts spells, that lulls men to sleep and teaches women to conceive, not children, but high thoughts. I had in me the heart which creates illusion and mists, the double vision and appearance. Behind appearance I laid my plans. I fashioned my traps, and when the time came and the sun rose upon me in my mists and my darkness, then I was ready. Then I was no longer a helpless stock, its feet fast in prison earth. I lifted my foot, I stepped down the path, treading upon the necks of my enemies till I reached my throne. There I reigned, there and then, indeed, I was the living scarecrow with power to affright, to terrify, to drive out of my own country the black things with wings. I drove them from my fields, I scared them from my woods, I burned their nests, I cut down their rookeries and their roosts. I cleared my skies of them, losing the winds of God, loosing the winds of God. They came at me again. From Scotland they flocked across at me, but I caught her, the queen crow, and I wrung her neck. They caught at me from France, and I scared them away. I burned them out of Ireland till flesh and feathers stank. 
They flocked over from Spain in hordes. I drowned their hordes. Have you ever seen a crow drown? Its black, wigs spread, its black wings spread out and hold it, swimming upon Tam's water, but it cannot rise, though its head bobs clear, and so it bobs past the tower, down the tide, squawking till it is sucked under. Thus they drown in the channel. After our martyr there came no more crows from over sea. But at home there were always crows. Remember, at home there will always be crows. Remember. How harsh, thought Ben, quivering to the voice like a glass bowl rubbed round and round by a finger wet by a finger by a wet fingertip. How harsh is that remember. Remember, my poor valiant anti crow, my barren stock of dreams, that the creatures are bold. One of them now and again will hop, be sure of it, within reach of your hand, and you will not know him, for he will be well disguised in a man's beauty of a long talking of long talking hands, brave shoulders, narrow hips. He will have brown silken hair, dreamer's eyes, the tongue of an angel, and he'll stick a Tudor rose behind his ear. He will wear on his finger that blue ring of yours, wheedled from you. You will like to see it there and give him a jewel to hang on his breast. But one day you will learn that within the breast beats the black heart of a crow. There was one that hopped as high as my heart. But he would not rest there. He would have clawed off my crown. And yet he swore to me, wrote it in a fine letter, that he could be content with hips and haws and brambleberry and prayed that his tomb might be a bush where harmless robin dwells with gentle thrush and sighs himself my majesty's exiled and signs himself my majesty's exiled servant ah well i have heard of a wolf in sheep's clothing but not till then i told him had i known a carrion call himself a singing bird then he changed his tune then i was a king in petticoats old my mind as crooked as my carcass but I answered him, or was it to another one? And I said, though I am lame, my affairs do not halt, nor must yours, for you are lame, crooked baron. Confess it to me, are you not lame? I am lame, Ben humbled himself. A crooked carcass? Oh me, I am wrapped and crooked. And he upraised his thin arm, spreading the fingers against the red ceiling. A stock, a barren stock. The English Scarecrow, the Scarecrow, tell me all I have to know. But he was told no more. With a mutter and a groan, the voice had ceased, and the unendurable vibrations ended. It was an exquisite relief to him. His eyes wandered away from the dim portrait. Nothing held them. He was thinking his own thoughts, strong, renewed thoughts. He felt as if he had eaten and drunk a large meal. It made him sleepy, and as he drowsed, he saw his next steps clearly. He needed Illico, but he need not wait for Illico. There was much that he could do before Illico came. He must get into touch with the common people, please them, find out their wants, wishes, get them upon his side. Petal, he could use young Petal. He would go and find him, and Petal's friends should be his friends. He would put thoughts into their heads. He would rouse them. He would tell them why they were slaves, why they worked so hard for such poor pay, why they were sent out like serfs to spill their blood. It was because the land was poor, as every land was poor. It was poor because it was preyed upon, and had been these thousand years by crows, scare them and burn them off the, and burn them off the fields, out of the trees, rid the earth and the very air of them, and then see how rich and happy England should be. All the world should be, but begin at the bottom. Begin with the men servants and the women servants, the children of the hilltop, the nameless, the oppressed. Yes, his course was now clear. And we will pause there.